Consider that a man without the grace of God is like a tree without roots, a vine without life-giving sap, a tool without the artisan. It is precisely these things which you yourself have accomplished. If they are worthy of any praise and recognition that you ought to strive and desire to ascribe to God. In the face of many of the faithful converting to Protestantism around the middle of the 16th century, the Catholic Church responded with counter-reformation, a call to spiritual renewal and moral reform. At the same time, the Calvary movement grew rapidly in popularity. This movement consisted in visiting holy places and living out the mysteries of Christ's passion. In 1584, the Dutch academic Christian Krik van Adrichem replicated the view of Jerusalem from the beginnings of Christianity. He provided detailed maps as well as descriptions of the holy places, chapels, and stations. His work played a very significant role in the creation of shrines dedicated to the Christ's Passion. The idea of recreating the sites related to the last days of our Savior's life and death also became popular in Poland. Such sites were called New Jerusalem. Paradoxically, this time of counter-reformation is also the time of calamities and great moral depravity in Poland. Seeing such a great misfortune in his homeland, the first bishop to reside in Warsaw, Bishop Stefan Wierzbowski, who was distinguished by his deep and sincere devotion, decided to create a New Jerusalem in the Mazovia region as well. He wished in this way to encourage the Polish nation to pray and repent. Located 30 kilometers away from Warsaw, near the town of Czersk, on the land presently occupied by the city of Gura Kalvaria, there was a deserted village called Gura, which was destroyed in the course of numerous Swedish attacks. That was precisely the place chosen by the bishop. So in 1670, Bishop Wierzbowski purchased this village and obtained permission from Michał Korybut Wiśniowiecki to found a town there with the name New Jerusalem. It was meant to be a replica of Jerusalem in the Holy Land. According to the bishop's vision, the town residents had lived exemplary lives as regards orthodoxy, morality, and piety, and were thus worthy of living in the places where the tombs of the Redeemer and His Blessed Mother were to be located. Their job was to serve the needs of the pilgrims and celebrations of the Passion devotions. Accordingly, the city plan was based on a cruciform pattern. At the intersection of the two main streets, a palace, the House of Pilate, was erected, while at the end of each arm of the cross there was a church. Each pilgrim entering or leaving the town received a welcome or send-off by a church. A broad road lined with the stations of the cross came out from Pilate's house and led to Calvary. The road was sprinkled with earth brought from Jerusalem. Bishop Wierzbowski wanted to make this a holy site, emphasizing in various ways the sanctity of the place, among others by bringing in religious orders of various spiritualities and charisms. There were thus very strict orders such as the Dominican Sisters, the teaching orders such as the Piarists and the Dominican Friars. In total there were seven religious orders.
Seven churches with the adjacent monasteries towered over the city and could be seen from afar. It was unprecedented in Europe, unparalleled by any other Calvary foundation. Having visited this place, Bishop Ignacy Krasitsky wrote, I have seen something like a city with a few mediocre houses, yet with churches standing side by side. In place of an inn, there was the house of Pilate, the house of Herod. Bishop Wierzbowski's enterprise proved to be a success. The shrine grew to become one of the most prominent pilgrimage sites in the Polish Republic already in his own lifetime and then later in the 18th century, prior to the partitions of Poland. Before starting this work, Bishop Wierzbowski consulted his confessor, the Venerable Father Stanisław Papczyński, whom he had known and with whom he was friends for many years. The bishop had great sympathy and respect for Father Stanisław. He appreciated his apostolic zeal and his ascetic, pious lifestyle. It was from Bishop Wierzbowski that Father Papczyński received permission to wear the white habit. It was also Father Papczyński whom the bishop invited to participate in the creation of the City of the Lord's Passion. Explaining his reason, the bishop allegedly said of Father Papczyński, he humbly refused various prelatures offered to him by bishops who favored him. But having been led by God's Spirit into the wilderness and having taken a few companions, he lived a life so strict and exemplary that it persuaded us to move him to our inherited town, New Jerusalem. And so, in 1677, the Marians were given charge of the Church of Our Lord's Senecal, popularly called the Senecal. They had to lead processions, hear the pilgrims' confessions, and organize the enactments of the mystery plays associated with the Eucharist, such as Corpus Christi, Pentecost, and Holy Thursday. Most of all, they had to prepare the faithful to make the pilgrimage around the Holy City. Built in 1674 by Bishop Wierzbowski, the Senecal was a humble little church. Some people even dared to irreverently call it a barn. Bishop Wierzbowski's appreciation of Father Stanisław continued to grow, and he became increasingly more protective of the order, which the latter had founded. In 1679, he granted his canonical approval of the order of diocesan rite, and in 1699, thanks to his efforts, the Marians received their first papal privileges. The last meeting between Father Papczyński and the bishop was significant. It took place a few days before the latter's death. The bishop was giving away his estate to various religious orders. Father Papczyński came in last and asked the bishop for his blessing. The bishop, realizing that he had given away almost everything, said, To you, the Marians, I leave divine providence. Father Stanisław knew at once that he had received something that was very precious. After this event, people began to also call the Senecal the Shrine of Divine Providence. Compared to other nearby shrines, the Senecal was extremely modest, and the Marians were a poor, young religious order. Surprisingly enough, out of the entire, rather large complex of shrines dedicated to the Passion, only this poorest church survived until today, and the Marians are the only religious order that continues to serve until this day in Gura Calvaria, as well as in 18 countries worldwide. Perhaps it was indeed divine providence given to Father Papczyński that protected them and their work from annihilation by history. In laying the foundations for his New Jerusalem, 
Peshevish Boski strictly observed the measures, distances, and descriptions contained in the Van Adrichem's work. The cenacle was placed exactly according to the indications found in his plans and descriptions. The Marians began to reside at the shrine in November of 1677, where a small cloister already stood. The church stood on very poor, swampy grounds and what was surrounded by marshes. That is why Father Papczynski and his confreres in the beginning had to work very hard on the drainage of the grounds so that they could at least walk to the church. Eventually, with great effort on behalf of the Marians and people from the vicinity, the grounds were drained. In the spring, when it rained hard, the cenacle was accessible only by boat. The grounds kept getting swampy whenever the drainage ditches weren't cleaned for a few years. They kept filling up, the area was flood prone. The church itself was flooded repeatedly. There are still marks on its walls and foundations. Father Stanislav Papczynski labored for the sanctification of the faithful in the area. Many testimonials speak of his care for the poor. He was dubbed the father of the poor and defender of the oppressed. He often visited hospitals and orphanages and gave alms to the underprivileged and the homeless. He never sent a poor person away with nothing. Father Papczynski tirelessly preached and administered the sacraments in New Jerusalem. He also assisted the parish priests in the area. It was for this reason that he was also named the Apostle of Mazovia. Traveling on foot throughout the region, visiting the neighboring and distant churches in Mashtonov, Fiskitki and Gruyets, Father Papczynski continued to do his work of preaching the gospel and hearing confessions. If Father Stanislav was going to Levitchen on foot, he had to walk almost 60 kilometers. Father Stanislav's apostolic missions were marked by such graces, such miracles and supernatural events as people would say, by which God seemed to approve his zeal and holiness, as well as his authentic Marian apostolic vocation. Father Papczynski was also a mystic. He had experienced spiritual visions and ecstasies. Father Stanislav was reported to have a vision during which it seemed as if he died in an ecstasy as if he was no longer alive. There were a few such visions, such as contacts with the suffering souls in purgatory. After waking up, Father Papczynski would tell his confreres to pray for the dead because they suffered unbearable pains. Within his order, he placed great emphasis on the various forms of expiation for the dead. So, there were mortifications, penance, and flagellations for the dead, as well as prayers, rosaries, and masses. Also, for those passed away in serious sin during wars, because, as is known about war, they died without being prepared for their departure from this life. Father Papczynski had the gift of healing various diseases, fevers, and headaches. He would make the sign of the cross on the sick person's forehead, mouth, and chest, while saying, May the cross and name of my Lord Jesus Christ be the health of your body and soul. Amen. Then he would bless the drink prepared for the patient and say a short prayer. There was a ceremony in New Jerusalem with a procession. One of its stations was the cenacle.
There is a story about the gathering of some storm clouds that frightened the pilgrims so much that they began to disperse. Pątników do tego stopnia, że zaczęli się rozpraszać. Father Papczyński allegedly said, stay here, not a drop of rain shall fall on your heads. He made a sign of the cross in the direction of the clouds which parted and dispersed. Then he reverently preached the sermon and the pilgrims completed the procession. At the Church of Our Lord's Senecal, there was a side altar dedicated to the Archangel Raphael. Father Papczyński used to frequently pray before that altar, where, as it was believed by the pilgrims, many miracles took place. A noble woman, the mother of a teenage girl, had a dispute with Father Papczyński about the nearby forests and lands. When her daughter fell seriously ill, the desperate woman was seeking the help of the Dominicans. However, despite their prayers, they weren't able to help. They advised her to go to Father Stanisław. Since she had blamed Father Papczyński, she was hesitant. As she entered, Father Papczyński already knew the reason. He said, I know why you came, but your daughter is no longer alive. In her despair, the woman began asking him to pray that God would perform a miracle. Father Stanisław told her to bring her daughter to the church. There, in the middle of the church, was a large table, just as in Jerusalem, in the synagogue. Without a doubt, this event had a great impact on Father Papczyński's fame of holiness, because many people started coming here and asking for his praise. King Jan III Sobieski visited New Jerusalem. After meeting with Father Papczyński, the king took the newly founded order under his protection. On June 2, 1679, he issued a decree that stated, We most willingly consent to this most pious institute's expansion and the erection of its houses as well in other places of our kingdom. When King Jan Sobieski was preparing to go to Vienna to stop the Turkish expansion from spreading all over Europe, Blessed Stanisław's prayers supported him. They had previously known each other. The king often used to kneel in Father Stanisław Papczyński's confessional. Sometimes he would ask for his advice. Ojca Stanisława Papczyńskiego czasem zasięgał jego rady.
Some say that Father Papchinsky even accompanied the Hetman Jan Sobieski on the expedition against the Turks. Naturally, Father Papchinsky supported all the soldiers at Vienna with ours. The Marians received many possessions and privileges from King Jan III Sobieski. Father Papczyński was a renowned and respected theologian and the author of many works. Eight of them have survived to date. These works include meditations, reflections on the sacred scripture, speeches related to specific events, and a textbook on rhetoric. One of the most valuable works is the textbook on spirituality, Templum Dei Mysticum, The Mystical Temple of God, published in 1675. This work is considered to be the first textbook on spirituality for the laity in Poland. Father Stanisław was also a good confessor. In his days, a confessor had to have special abilities to hear confessions because priests often were not sufficiently educated. This is why many important church and state personalities used to go to Father Papczyński for confessions and advice. Among them was the Nuncio Pignatelli, later Pope Innocent XII, who also benefited from Father Stanisław's spiritual direction and confession. After many years of untiring efforts, Father Stanisław's great desire came to pass. In 1699, Pope Innocent XII approved the Marian Order as an order of pontifical right. Father Papczyński's life mission came to an end. Shortly afterwards, on September 17, 1701, the founder of the Marians died with a reputation for sanctity. The coffin with his body was placed under the Senecal's floor, in the marshy ground. In the course of the following years, the coffin was opened several times because it was flooded with water. Yet even 20 years after Father Papczyński's death, his body remained untouched by decomposition. In 1738, Father Kazimir Wyszynski started endeavors to save the church and the convent, but above all the damaged tomb of Father Stanislav. For this purpose he had a sarcophagus built out of bricks. In 1752 the remains of the deceased were transferred into a new coffin, which was sealed and padlocked. Unfortunately, successive caskets continued to rot because of the flooding water. In 1766, another sarcophagus, this time a raised one, was built which stands in the Church of Our Lord's Senecal to this day. An Italian architect, Jacob Fontana, was probably its designer. After the death of Father Papczyński, the Church of Our Lord's Senecal suffered many vicissitudes of history. In 1782, there were 16 religious residing at the church. At that time, the Theological Institute for Seminarians was also located there. After the Third Partition of Poland, New Jerusalem found itself in the Prussian sector, whose government sought to destroy the Catholic Church. More and more churches in New Jerusalem were destroyed the Senecal's state of repair worsened. Around 1850, due to a lack of funds for the renovation, the Marians left the monastery and went to live on a nearby farm. After the dissolution of monasteries in 1864, they were forced to definitely withdraw from the Church of Our Lord Senecal. Soon after, the roof collapsed, the windows were shattered, However, there always has been someone who saved the church from demolition. 
As a result of suppression of the religious orders, only one Marian, Father Vincent Sienkowski, was still alive in 1908. It looked as if the order was destined for complete extinction. However, the work of Blessed Stanislav Papczynski was so pleasing to God that Divine Providence decided otherwise. In 1909, thanks to the efforts of Blessed Jerzy Matulevich, who later became the General Superior of the Marians, the renewal of the congregation was achieved and more and more new vocations arrived. Initially, the Marians returned to the Church of Our Lord Senecal secretly and then openly. Increasing numbers of pilgrims started coming to Father Papczynski's tomb. They prayed for his intercession before God. The celebration of devotions and of the liturgy was resumed. Some celebrations gathered several thousand faithful. For the arriving pilgrims, the Marians had to reserve the entire narrow-gauge train that shuttled from Warsaw to Gura Calvaria. A decisive turn in the Senecal's history came in 1952. In that year, the primate of Poland, Stefan Wyszynski, transferred to the Marians the entire parish in Gura Calvaria, together with the Church of the Senecal. The Marians took up residence at this place once again, this time on a permanent basis. After several years of endeavors, the long-awaited total renovation of the Church of the Lord Senecal was completed in 1962. Also, a large square with the field altar was built. From 2006 to 2007, the church building was expanded in such a way as to bring back, at least partially, its original appearance. A vestry and porch were added in accordance with the 17th and 18th century plans. To commemorate the character of Gura Calvaria as a place to remember the Lord's Passion, 15 Stations of the Cross, carved in stone by the renowned sacral artist Hanna Groholska, were placed around the square. The Book of Graces at the Cenacle contains many records about special graces and miracles granted through the intercession of Father Papczynski. Childless couples, pregnant women at risk of miscarriage, those addicted, broken families and married couples, and children and young people with learning difficulties can count on Blessed Stanislav's special help. At Father Papczynski's tomb, a miracle was begged from God in prayer and obtained of raising a dead baby in its mother's womb back to life. Thus the way to Father Stanislav's beatification, which had been eagerly awaited for centuries, was opened up. On September 16, 2007, in Lichen, the long-awaited event in the history of the Marian Fathers, namely Father Papczynski's beatification, took place. The workings of Divine Providence is truly amazing for the humblest of all of the New Jerusalem's churches. The Church of the Lord Senecal, which became the center of attention for thousands of Polish and foreign faithful, and of the cardinals and bishops from the Vatican. The papal legate, the then Secretary of State of the Holy See, Cardinal Tarcisio Bertone, arrived at the Church of Our Lord Senecal by a special helicopter. He delivered the Holy Father Benedict XVI's personal gift to the Senecal, an engraved chalice. The next day, a ceremony of thanksgiving for the beatification of the Marian's founder, 
presided over by Cardinal Franz Rode, the then prefect of the Congregation for Institutes of Consecrated Life, was held. Today the Church of Our Lord Senegal is teeming with life. It is an important pastoral and evangelization center. Every year a youth meeting is held here in May. Prayers, meditations on the Word of God, concerts, theatrical performances, and catechesis are only a part of the great work of evangelization which was started by Father Papchinsky. A ceremony that gathers crowds of devotees of Blessed Stanislav and of Divine Providence is held three times a year at the Church of Our Lord's Senegal. The ceremony is presided over by cardinals, bishops, and the major superiors of the Congregation of Marian Fathers. There is no trace left of the great city complex in honor of the Lord's Passion built by Bishop Wierzbowski with the exception of this little church. Blessed Stanislav saved it from oblivion by listening to countless requests of the faithful who prayed to God for a specific grace through his intercession. Interceding for us before God, Father Stanislav of the Senegal showed us by the example of his life how to walk along the path to heaven.